Let's start with Simon. Simon's a prominent American political strategist, veteran of presidential and congressional campaigns, founder of the Dune Democratic Network, and a really wise voice that all of us have looked to. In the weeks leading up to the midterm, Simon and Tom Bonier of Target Smart Data were lonely voices questioning the red tsunami that so many predicted. Strangely, they looked at real data, voter registration, early voting patterns, and so were able to make accurate projections despite all the pundits embracing the red wave. For years now, Simon has had an acute understanding of the electorate and its dynamic changes. Welcome, Simon. The floor is yours. Michael, thank you. And thanks to all of you for all the work uh, that you did this cycle. I want to just, I want to agree with Michael that, you know, we had so many close elections that, you know, the collective work of the family uh, this time really made a huge difference. And I think it's one of our great assets as we go forward. Let me try to, I, I've written a lot since the election. So on my website at ndn.org, I'm, I'm, you, there's plenty more if there's stuff here that you hear that you're interested in. I'm just going to try to do a very top line uh, overview and then take your questions. And, and I think the most important thing I can leave you with is that the Democratic Party is strong today. I think that this last cycle we all know that we kind of got down a little bit, you know, that there were there were morale problems. We were, it started, I think, during the BBB fight, and there was a lot of kind of negativity in the family. Um, and we felt weak and they felt strong and we were worried and they seemed like they were gonna kick our butt. And where we are today, I think, is that we're strong and they're weak. We're united and they're divided. Our campaigns are superior to theirs and theirs are struggling. You know, I would rather must I much rather be us than them in so many ways. And I think as we head into the 2024 cycle, the most important thing is that we have to start from a place of believing in ourselves. We just had an extraordinary election. We kicked ass together, all of us. Um, we defied history. I mean, you all know the details. But to me, you know, what is most important about what happened in this election is that there were this was not a nationalized election. I mean, the red wave was wrong in so many ways. But one of the ways that it was wrong is there wasn't a single election this time, which is very unusual. There were two. There was a bluer election that happened inside the battlegrounds, and there was a redder election that happened outside the battlegrounds. And let's talk about each of those and why they matter so much going forward. The success we had inside the battlegrounds really was historic. We actually gained ground in this election despite high inflation and Joe Biden's low approval rating in Arizona, Colorado, uh, Georgia, Minnesota, Michigan, New Hampshire, and Pennsylvania. We actually gained ground from 2020 in these critical states that determine the presidency and control of the House and Senate. It's an extraordinary achievement. Uh, by the party collectively. And it's our third consecutive strong election in a row. Um, and part of the reason this happened is that in, because of the work that all of you did, our campaigns had much more money than their campaigns did. And we now have the biggest campaigns that we've ever had. I mean, we have monstrous campaigns compared to those of us who've been in this business for a long time. You know, when we had campaigns of two or three people, you now have these enormous campaigns where we're, we're our candidates had two, three, four times the money that their candidates had. And what's happening is we have the biggest campaigns that we've ever seen in our, in our history. Why does that matter? It mattered because it allowed us to control the information environment inside the battleground where their noisy red wave kind of, you know, and Fox News and the, all the assets they have to sort of dictate the discourse in the country was neutralized. Mm -hmm. um, and second of all, it allowed us, as we saw in Tom Bonnier and the work that Tom and I did on the early vote, because our parties now embrace the early vote, and because we have so many volunteers, and we have such a large grassroots enterprise, we're now going into second and third tier uh, GOTV targets, you know, a week before the election, not at two o'clock in the afternoon on the election, right? This is a completely different kind of grassroots operations than we've ever had. And it's more important for us to be able to do that than them, because our, we have more voters, but we have more irregular voters. We have more new voters. And so the ability to have these huge muscular GOTV operations that are now working for two weeks in many states, not just for two days or a day, is a huge structural advantage that we have going into 2024. 
The most common complaint Republicans had about what happened in the election was that they got beat in the early vote. And what that meant, and this is a big problem for them because they don't have this kind of ecosystem that we have that you guys have all built for us and, and groups like this all across the country. Um, they can't catch up with us on this in the next two years. They may be able to in four years or eight years, but right now we go into 2024, we're a stronger party than they are. They may have more money, but our money is better spent. It's more in hard dollars, which goes much further than the than the soft dollars. And the work that you guys have done to give us these unprecedentedly large and effective campaigns is why we made gains in Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, Michigan, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania. I want to repeat it because it's just so amazing, right? We were all told we were going to get our ass kicked. And that's not what happened in the election. We actually outperformed expectations. I think it's in part because when we control the information environment, we were able to tell the story that we made the country better. And Joe Biden's been a good president, which he has been. Um, and we are better off. And they're still a little too crazy and still too MAGA. And I think that basic dynamic is going to be the dynamic heading into 2024 as well, right? Is that we've done a good job and they're still a little too crazy. And then we have the added advantage of having these muscular campaigns. But the flip side of that is that where we didn't have these big campaigns, outside the battleground, the Republicans gained. And that's why when you look at the national analysis, you know, they won more votes than we did, which is sort of a shocking thing. But it's largely because of the of the huge shift that happened in the four biggest states in the country, in Florida, Texas, New York, and California, where Democrats were not effective in way, or didn't choose to or weren't effective in waging large campaigns like we had in the battlegrounds. The Republicans made gains. And it's a reminder that they are still louder than we are, that they still control the daily discourse. The red wave was a fiction that they were able to sort of perpetrate over all of us. And I can talk a little bit more about this if you want in the Q&A. But think about all the memes that they can put into the national discourse, fentanyl and Halloween candy, right? Which was to me the craziest of them all. But this idea that, for example, women were caring more about eggs costing three cents more than they were about losing bodily autonomy. I mean, you go through all the various things that they pushed into the national discourse, they still have that, that's an advantage they have. And one of the things that I, the, the advice I'm giving to the family as we head into 2024, is that we have to get louder. We have to not just do all that we're doing in these battlegrounds and these building these big campaigns and helping our candidates win, but collectively we have to become information warriors. We have to become more intentional about not letting them control the discourse every day. You know, I worked in the war room in 1992. And, you know, in the war room, the concept, I helped build the war room. I helped design it. I ran it with Carville and Stephanopoulos. I was a young guy, but I was deeply involved in it. And part of the premise of the war room was that we had to win the information war every day. It wasn't about rapid response. It was about making sure that we won the daily news fight so that we could control the discourse in the country. Well, we're going to have to now think of the war room not as 20 kids in a headquarters drinking Red Bulls, right? But 4 million people going to work every day together being louder than what the right has built. And I think this is one of the most important things that we can do. I hosted an event yesterday with four terrific organizations who all of you should get to know who are doing amazing work in helping us get louder. Um, you know, the Midas Touch, which is a powerful new entrant into our space. Resolute Square, which is a new media company that Joe Trippi is building, um, a group called Courier Newsroom, which has uh, local left-leaning news organizations in most of the battleground states, a woman named Tara McGowan from Rhode Island. Um, and uh, the fourth is David Rothkopf, who's built an amazing media company called Deep State Radio, which is more intellectual and erudite, but is also very, very thoughtful in the way they approach. We're seeing not only incredible innovation happening at the grassroots level in organizations like this that are growing up all over the country. But we're also seeing incredibly important innovation happening at the media level, not C4s and C3s, not political organizations. These are media organizations. Part of what the right did is they defined media organizations as core to their politics. Fox News, OAN, Rush Limbaugh, Talk Radio. They expanded the definition of what a political movement was to include media. Media has much more, you know, they have much more free speech. It's much easier to, to be partisan, you know, with the money that we have, you know, in these media organizations. So to me, this is a new and very exciting set of, you know, entrants into our space that add to the, to the power that we have. 
And I think for this year, there are going to be three big issues where we have to win the debate and that are going to be critical to positioning us strongly for 2024. One is the economy. The biggest thing that's going to happen now because of what Republicans are doing with um, the debt ceiling and, and sort of extremist economic policies is we're going to have a big debate about the economy. And we shouldn't be losing the economic debate to the Republicans. I mean, I have this presentation called With Dems, Things, Things Get Better. And one of my slides is, shows that since 1989, there have been 47 million jobs created in America. 45 million of those have happened under Democratic presidents. Essentially, all of the growth that's happened in America since 1989 has happened with us being in the White House. We've done our part. We've moved the country forward. We've seen growth and jobs and wages go up and deficits go down and progress made. When they've been in power, we've had three consecutive recessions, spiraling deficits, and the country has gone into to decline. We have to establish this year this fundamental contrast between our repeated success as economic stewards and their repeated failure. We shouldn't be losing the economic debate to these guys, right? Number two is Ukraine and the war. You know the Republicans want to pull the plug. Right. And we could have a long debate about how they ended up. The party of Reagan ended up in the place that they are in these issues. But we need to stay the course on the war. We need to defeat Putin and wound him, keep the West united, do what Joe Biden talks about, which is signing up, as our party did before in previous times, to win this battle of a democracy versus autocracy. This is a huge the party of Wilson and FDR is being called again to fight another set of international battles. And the third is immigration. I think we're going to have a big battle around immigration. And that's another one that we need to win. These are three consequential battles that will set the table for 2024 that we need to not just show up and pass legislation, but we need to convince the American people that we're right and they're wrong. And all of you have a role to play in this. All of you, I hope, will not only do your traditional work that you do, but start to get informed on the issues, spread the information through your network, and help us all collectively be louder. I think if we can do that this year, this is a big collective responsibility. We can't let them continue to drown us out in the daily discourse. And there's more we can be doing. And certainly that's what I, that's one of the reasons I'm here tonight, right? Is that my organization is producing lots of good data, lots of good analysis that you can use, you know, in any way that you can uh, at the grassroots level. I am doing my With Democrats presentation next week. If you come to my website, you can sign up for it. It's a 30 minute, data-filled deep dive on, on how I'm de when Democrats are in power, things get better. And so let me say the last thing is that to me, what has what kept me going during this fight against the red wave, Tom Bonnier and I, you know, we were attacked by Nate Silver and by Dave Wasserman from Cook and other private reporters made fun of us and mocked us. We were became a, a to people who are ridiculed in the national media for our believing in Democrats and believing in all of us. I just want you all to know that part of what kept me going through all of that was events like this that I did with people all over the country. And what I saw when I was doing these events were proud patriots signing up to go fight every day for their country they love, to not let the crazy people take over. And the passion and the intensity of the grassroots that I felt in my journey is why I believed uh, that we were going to prevail. And so I just want to say, as somebody who's been in this thing for a long time, probably too long, my wife keeps wondering when I'm going to get a real job someday, um, is that uh, I just want to say thanks to all of you. I mean, what makes us, what makes me confident that we're going to prevail again in 2024 is the organizations like this, the passion that I see, the patriotism that is and love of country that comes out of every one of these meetings I'm in. And thank you so much for what you've done and what you're going to do in this cycle. Thanks, everybody. Questions? Yes, thank you, Simon. The questions are pouring in. I'm going to try and, uh, with Kristen's help, group some Tri of Triage, yeah. Yeah. So um, there, there are a couple that are sort of saying, okay, uh, it was a good year in most of the battleground states, but Maryland says, not so great in North Carolina. Sherry says, I'm from Ohio. Why was Ryan ignored? Maybe with support, he could have won. Uh, they're already passing laws to make voting harder. Harder. Patty says Florida Dems did not show up. Turner was turnout was lower than 2018. Uh, youth turnout was about the same, a bit lower, and still only 27 to 9, 29 yeah. percent. So, what sort of talk about those three states? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Look, I mean, I, so you got to start from the basic place. 
that the fact that we were even competitive was incredible, right? I mean, I, I, I just given the historic trends in midterm elections, Biden's approval rating, I mean, there was a general view in Washington that if Biden didn't get up to 45, 46, we wouldn't be competitive. And he was at 42, 43 on election day, right? So, you know, we needed those two or three extra points to bring a few more of these states into being competitive. And inflation, as you all know, was too high, right? I mean, just the adversity that we were facing was unbelievable and we overcame it, but we didn't do it everywhere, right? It wasn't a perfect election, but it was a really good election and we're a stronger party for what happened in this election. I do think that North Carolina to me is the most important of the states that we didn't, that we were disappointed in, in terms of 2024. There's a lot there that we, we should be doing better in North Carolina. And if you go back to the 2004 Bush election, which is the last time the Republicans had a, you know, won the popular vote and won the Electoral College, only six states have flipped from that election towards the Democrats. It's been Georgia and Virginia, you know, the New South, and then the four Southwestern states, Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico. And so we've got, I think we do need to go into North Carolina and make this a serious priority. And yeah, I mean, Ohio was disappointing. Wisconsin, the Senate race there was disappointing. And Florida, there needs to be a big, patient, and heavily funded Florida project the way there needs to be a Texas project. You know, I've worked a lot in Florida. I've done a lot in the Hispanic vote over the years and the Cuban American vote. Florida was very disappointing. And, and I think, you know, we shouldn't, you know, we can't, I'm one of those that are fighting to make sure Florida doesn't get uh, pushed off into the Atlantic Ocean by the Democratic Party. And, um, but sure, yeah, it wasn't perfect, but my God, did we do well. And, but we still have a lot of work to do. We didn't win the House. I want people to realize about the House, and I, and I was the chief strategist for the DCCC in the 2018 cycle. So I've been in the game recently, and it's part of the reasons I think my analysis has been more right than wrong is because I'm not just an old guy kind of mailing it in here. I mean, I got I gotten dirty in recent elections, is that um, the House was essentially a jump ball. And, and, and it, you know, we essentially lost by 4,000 votes in five races. I mean, it, you know, if the ball, if things had been a little bit better, we would have won. It would have been extraordinary. But I do think that one of the things that's going to be incredible this cycle is that if what Republicans are going to be dealing with in the battleground in all these states is a wariness of MAGA, right? People now in the battleground have voted against MAGA in three consecutive elections. There's muscle memory here. The ability for the Republicans to create distance from MAGA is one of their highest strategic priorities in this next cycle. And it's going to be very, very hard for them because of the House Republicans. And also DeSantis, as those of you in Florida know, he's just as he's just as MAGA as Trump. I mean, this notion that DeSantis is somehow some kind of moderate, mainstream country club Republican is just incredible horseshit, right? And and so I think they're gonna have a very hard time shaking. MAGA as they head into 2024, which is one of the reasons that I would rather be us than them as we head into the election. So lots more questions. We'll try and go through them quickly. Well, actually, yes. How do you see our challenge in holding on to the Senate in 24? So if I had to do my forecasting, and of course, forecasts change every day, but tonight where I'm sitting is I think, you know, we're favored to win the presidency. I think we're favored to flip the House. I believe that. The Senate is going to be really hard. Um, and because, um, you know, we have three states that are going to be difficult for us in the presidential year, right? It's, it's uh, Montana, West Virginia, and Ohio, uh, where we've got very strong. The good news, last election, all of our incumbents won. Um, and I'm sorry if I got, if my internet, let me just turn off my phone and see if that helps a little bit. Can you still hear me okay? Yep. Yep, we're good. Okay, okay. Um, so the Senate is going to be hard, and you know I think that as you decide your plan and where you engage over the next few months, my advice to you as an organization, because I get asked this often, you know, what would you do? I still think the biggest bang for the buck is in House races outside the battleground. I think that's where you get the biggest return. I think our Senate races now, we're raising so much money in these races that, you know, many, I'm not going to say they can take care of themselves, but, you know, pay attention, you know, go to where the hard stuff is. Don't do the easy stuff, right? That's where I, and that's one of the things I've learned about this new post-MAGA grassroots that's developed in the Democratic Party is that 
you guys aren't doing the easy stuff, right? It's one of the reasons we're doing so well is that you, this is a sophisticated party now. You, these are sophisticated organizations. You're making sophisticated choices about how you allocate your, you know, uh, helping in house races outside the battleground still is probably where you'll get your biggest bang for the buck. Because inside the battleground, the presidential battleground, are between the presidential elect candidate that we have, whoever that is, if Joe Biden chooses to run, I don't think he'll have a primary challenge and he'll be the nominee. And if he chooses not to run, I think we're going to have a very spirited primary of really wonderful next generation Democrats. I think that that's what I want to keep saying to all of you is that what Pelosi did, the elegance of what Nancy Pelosi did in the generational handoff that happened in the House is the beginning of a generational turn and the wheel is turning in the Democratic Party and the party of Biden and Clinton and Sanders and Pelosi is now yielding to this next party. I will tell you, as somebody who's been doing this a long time, this next party is, I would argue, and I believe is actually stronger than the party that we had. The leaders that are coming up are, we're gonna be in good hands. The handoff is gonna be successful. We've already seen it with Hakeem. How? terrific is he, how powerful is he as an orator and a public communicator, and he's running a clean and well-run caucus in the House. You know, don't be scared. If Joe Biden doesn't run, and I hope he does, and I'll support him, but if he doesn't, we're going to have a wonderful primary that's going to accelerate a necessary generational transition that's going to come anyway. And, and, and don't fear it. I think we're in good shape as a family uh, in the years to come. So uh, we're going to have to take just one more question. Yeah. I've got 20, so I'm trying to figure out. I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> no. uh, really clearly, Simon, we should have you back and just spend an hour with you. I think. I'm happy to, happy to do it. I, I've really, these, uh, energize, these energize me, I'll tell you. These, these events energize me. All right. So Marilyn asks, um, Simon, I give a lot of credit to grassroots groups working outside the Democratic Party. They're building capacity and combining year-round organizing with electoral organizing. Do you agree? Yep. Yeah, look, I, I actually had a long, I met with Jamie Harrison recently. I Tom Bonnier and I were brought down to a, an offsite of the state chairs and um, and of the, the DNC after the election, and we presented about the election. Um, uh, and I, I talked to Jamie, I met with Jamie for over an hour. And, you know, Jamie ran a state party, right? He's a local guy. And I told him that, I was blown away by what I saw this cycle, that something's changed in our family, that there is this layer of groups like this one that have made us much more muscular and stronger and more capable than I understood. I didn't really understand that this, I didn't understand all of this until my little red wave journey over the last six months. And I think what's so interesting about it, just as somebody who is a believer in the party, is that I think the strength of what you're doing in part is that you're outside the party. And, and the, that these groups are organic and they're very Tuckvillian, right? They've grown up in organic circumstances. And you also have choices, right? If you don't like this one, there's other ones you can join now, right? Because they're not necessarily geographically bound, right? They're horizontal, you know, across the country. Doug Linney's here tonight, an old dear friend of mine who's, you know, brought in a big California contingent. And, and I think that I, what I love about what I'm seeing is the sense of ownership and community that's building in these organizations that's very hard to replicate in a traditional party setting. So the reason that I want, I, I want to end with where I started, which is the Democratic Party is strong. They're weak. We're united. They're divided. We have lots of money. They struggle to raise money in their campaigns. We have better campaigns. They have weak campaigns. There, we have a constructive, smart, modern leader and a set an agenda that's made people's lives better. They're batshit crazy, right? So this contrast, we have to not give in ever again as Democrats to the negative sentiment that came over us over the last 12 months. Part of what I've come to believe as a former TV producer and writer and somebody who's studied all this stuff for a long time is that what MAGA and Trump and greater MAGA try to do every day is inject negative sentiment into our discourse. They want us to feel less about ourselves, our country, our democracy, each other, everything, our institutions, our leaders. We have to answer that with positive sentiment and, and to recognize the progress that's being made to become happy information warriors every day. This is the greatest country on earth. 
we would no every country would trade places with us in a minute. We cannot lose that sense of American exceptionalism, or they will win. And so part of my challenge to all of you as you go forward is feel good about your party. Feel good about this organization that you're part of. Feel good about your country. Feel good about your leaders. Enjoy it, right? We're doing good. We're strong. Our, we have a good president who's made the country better. We know when it's been otherwise, but this is not one of those times. And so I am really confident that because of all of you and this new set of institutions that have grown up to protect their country, proud patriots who've gotten off the sidelines and gone to work and postcards, all the stuff you all do, this is our secret power. This is why I believe that we're going to prevail again in 2024 is because of these new organizations that have come up. And it's why, frankly, Mike was joking. me. He's like, you're doing all these groups. I see all these emails. I'm doing it because I think you guys are amazing and I want to honor you and just say thank you. That's why I'm here. But we have another election where we got to go win. And so don't give up, no taking time off, all those things, right? But we also have to add one layer to what we do, which is this information warrior. And we'll keep in dialogue on this as we go forward. But thanks, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity. Keep kicking ass and let me know how I can help, okay? Thank you, Simon. Um, okay. And uh, we'll explore we'll explore doing a, a longer session just with you. And also, I'd remind everybody that Simon's yeah. organization, uh, NDN, is uh, the link is in the chat, uh, and they have uh, more events that you can go to and uh, much uh, more detailed analysis uh, on their mm -hmm. website. And uh, I'm sorry that you know we probably should have scheduled this for like three <laughs> hours. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Take care, everybody. I'm going to go have dinner. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you again. All right.